الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقال سبحانه وتعالى إن إبراهيم كان أم We begin reminding ourselves as we've been discussing about the virtues and the life and the importance of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. And this dars, this is not qasas al anbiya like we're not going over the lives of the, of the Prophet. This is because it's related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam and his lineage and his ancestry. So this is why we're discussing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ibrahim alayhi salam that he was an ummah. We discussed this uh, in, in detail last time, but there are a few points that I wanted to go over inshallah ta'ala uh, regarding this and, and we're continuing on first we discussed something very important that Ibrahim والسلام, he stood up against his society and his own father and everybody by himself and this is something amazing like imagine how important it is for us to understand and imagine his struggle because today we are, most of us here are minorities as far as being Muslims in majority kuffar countries. And we feel a little bit of that, like, you know, whether we admit it or not, whether we think about it or not. I mean, it's difficult. You want to go make salah. It's not like uh, most countries in the Muslim land where there's masajid, uh, two, three masajid per block. And every market has a masjid and every store has a masjid. So you just easily go make wudu. You're in the mall, you hear the adhan, everybody's going. Like, it's easy. But for us... It's a little more difficult. And when we go through the, the ills facing our society, right? meaning everything that our society as America, uh, or people like in England, Europe, and other places are facing, we have solutions as Muslims. Alhamdulillah. We have the Quran, we have the Sunnah, we have the Sharia, we have all these beautiful things to give solutions for the problem the society, whether it is the disease of the LGBTQXYZ stuff, or if it's housing bubbles, or if it's homelessness, or if it's uh, drug abuse, or alcohol abuse, or spousal abuse, all these things, Islam is a solution. But sometimes when we present that solution, or we're shy to present that solution because of the response that people will give. And if somebody sees you, and then they give you a name, and then suddenly you freak out, and yeah, now... Somehow that's changed your whole life because somebody looked at you funny. We need to go back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And look at that, that he stood up to his whole society by himself. He was constantly, and we'll talk about that today, he was constantly moving. Yani, sometimes we say, okay, there's a dars. Like for example, we have dars here in Mizribat. And there are brothers here, mashallah, that drive from LA, from San Bernardino, from other areas. There are brothers who drive from... Carmel Valley and these faraway areas and you know it's far and if they tell somebody hey I'm going to a dars let's go they'll be like what you want me to drive 40 minutes to go to a dars right but think about that right? look at Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam it's not like he's just going for three days or 40 days I mean, he's moving like he leaves that whole society repeatedly he, he puts his roots down and then he has to move by the will of Allah and he always did it obedient to Allah Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, he was not one to only talk about what people wanted to hear. Like this is today. Today, we always want to talk about what people want to hear. Every conference is about how Islam and democracy are the same. Islam and human rights. Islam and this. Islam and that. MashaAllah. Yani, to give the virtuous aspects of Islam within the boundary of the Qur'an and Sunnah, Alhamdulillah, that's good. But to address things that are ills of society, that the society does not want to hear, this is the way of the Anbiya. When we talk about shirk being bad, I'm not going to give percentages because I haven't done like a study, but if I had to guess, maybe 98% of the masajid would not want to hear this. Masajid. Not talking about churches or synagogues or temples, masajid. If you stand up and say shirk is haram and people who worship Isa ibn Maryam are doing dhulam because he was a prophet of Allah, people who worship cows and, and monkeys and, and rats and things, this is stupidity, this is dhulam, this is the haqq of Allah, masajid don't want to hear. Muslims don't want to hear. They don't want to put you in a conference, they don't want to put your face because why? They just want to be loved. 
They just want everybody to like them. Everybody, you're a mushrik, just like me. That's all I want. Let's lock hands, right? Just support my political cause. And I don't care what shirk you do, that's your business. No, that's not Islam. That's your idea. That's not Islam. The Anbiya came and told the people what you're doing is wrong. Ibrahim didn't just sit around the masjid and pray. He didn't just say, you know what? As one of the brothers, he didn't just say, you know what? Here in Iraq, which is the area he was, we have a lot of homeless people. We have a lot of poor people. So all the mushrikeen, while you're worshipping your idols, it's okay. But let's get some food together and feed the homeless, which is a good thing, alhamdulillah. And it's a good thing. But he didn't just say, let's just do that and we're good. And you worship your idol, it's okay. As long as you work together, what do they call it? Social, social justice, whatever. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Social justice is a part of Islam, no doubt. Those aspects are a part of Islam, but that's not all of Islam, and you can't leave the rest of Islam. Mm -hmm. He went and broke the idols, mm -hmm. and he broke the idols, and then he, you know, and this is not, a, we're not going deep into his life, just some points of benefit. And he did it in such a way that he opened up their mind towards that. Mm -hmm. And when they asked him who did it, He's like, I think it was the big one. He's got the axe, right? You know the story. I'm not going to go over the whole thing again. Right? But this is interesting. This is a point of Da'wah. They need to make, open their mind to realize, look, that idol can't do anything. He didn't say, can I sell you the idol? <laughs> Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, he stood up, not just against his father who was a mushrik, not just against his family, not just against his society, not just against the people of his city and his state and his country, his area, but he stood up against a king. Allah. Tell you, but what kind of a king? Today, may Allah protect us. I mean, and I'm saying for myself, being the weakest amongst you, if we had to stand up against a, a very strong president or prime minister or king that could torture us, that could kill us, that has tortured and killed people, wallahi, all of our hearts will start to like tremble. This is reality. Right? But imagine a king who ruled the whole known world. Like, think about this, right? Like, let's say uh, in America, what is it, Biden now or Trump? Does it matter? Anyway, so Biden now, right? Okay, so Biden. President Biden is the president of the United States. If somebody goes against Biden, let's say they treason to being a communist for some odd reason, right? They could go to a communist country like, what's there, any left right now? Cuba? Sure, Cuba, right? They could go to Cuba. Can Biden rule Cuba? No. His presidency is around him and then his vice president runs the country. And then around the country is it, right? Now, somebody could go to Russia. Putin, the emperor of Russia, he's there, right? And if somebody goes against Putin, they could go where? Here. They could come here, right? They could go to, I don't know, somewhere in Africa or some other country, right? Everybody has their own boundaries nowadays. But the king we will discuss, he ruled the known world. And we'll give evidences, inshallah. This dars is based on adillah, proofs, right? And I rechecked all these evidence. And even though I talked Sira before, I spent this whole week working and rechecking all of these to make sure we stay on what is authentic. But understand that. Think about that. There is nowhere to escape to. Every other small kingdom would also be under this king. Tell you. What is the dalil that he ruled the world, not just his kingdom? And, and what's his name? We will get to, inshallah. There is a riwayah, and this al-hakim has in his mustadrak from Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. But that sanad, in this hadith number 4,188. Uh, 4, this is in the copy that I have. And this riwayah is da'if. Most people mention this riwayah, and then, like, the reason I'm clarifying this, because what I, I, I make these durus, and I spend a lot of time and check asanid, and then I just mention it, and then some, mashallah, smart kid on Twitter thinks he knows better. And he finds one sanad somewhere and he's like, ha, you don't know. <laughs> Brother, before you give hukam, understand there are other asanid, there are other books. You have to look at all of that before you give a hukam. 
So this riwayah in Al-Hakim from Mu'awiyah radiyallahu is da'if. I'm just mentioning that, right? Ibn Jawzi has it from Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma, but there is no takhreej of it. Murfu'an from Nabi alayhi salatu salam. But because the sanad is not there that I could find, that I could authenticate, we'll leave that as well. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari has it from Mujahid. Mujahid the tabi'i. As Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, now this rawaya from Mujahid is Sahih. And I'll mention there is two asanid, one of them has a break, the other is connected. Ibn uh, Shaykh Islam Taqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah, he also accepted this rawaya and quoted it and authenticated it. Ibn Kathir also depended on it in Bidaya wa Nihaya, but he mentioned it from Sufyan al Thawri, which shows you the different asanid. A Siyuti has it in Durul Manthur, and he also authenticated it from Mujahid. Ibn Abi Shayba is where I found the strongest sanad in the Musannaf Ibn Abi Shayba. Because the one I found in a Tabari, he has it from Ibn Abi Najih. Ibn Abi Najih, the Sanad, the narrators are strong, but he didn't meet Mujahid. So there's a break. And most people always just see this and just say freak out, there's a break. But the Rawaya Ibn Abi Shayba, it takes you from Ibn Abi Najih to Al Qasim to Mujahid. So that break now is filled in. We know who was the missing narrator? Al Qasim. And because he's authentic, at best, we can say Sahih. At minimum, we can say Hassan because some of the narrators, there's difference of gradings. But no doubt, it's a reliable narration from Mujahid. It said, Nobody ruled the entire earth except four. Say it now. I wanted to clarify this. The entire known earth. We don't mean that they like, you know, ruled Antarctica and stuff, right? What was in front of them? Say it. Musliman wa kafiran. Two were Muslim and two were kafir. Some of the rawaiyat mention mu'minan, but this is the rawaiyat that is the strongest in, in chain. Amma musliman, for those that are musliman, for Suleiman ibn Dawood. Suleiman alayhi salatu salam wa dul qarnayn. Tayyib, Suleiman ibn Dawood, he's the Nabi of Allah. Everybody knows Suleiman ibn Dawood. And he and his father is a Nabi as well. Alayhum as salam. So he ruled a kingdom that covered everything. Even Bilqis and Shayban, everything came under his kingdom. Sooner or later. And Dhul Qarnayn, many of the people attribute him to be Alexander. And we find many scholars in the past that have said this, but this is incorrect because we know Dhul Qarnayn to be a very pious man. And we also know Alexander and his uh, interesting lifestyle. So even if some people have put it, we don't see any adilla for this. Rather, we see Dhul Qarnayn to bin have the great. And also Alexander didn't rule the world. He did have a pretty big kingdom, but he got stopped in uh, this Khaybar area. and he Couldn't go for, forward. So he definitely didn't rule the world either. Uh, but Dhul Qarnayn, as has been mentioned in the Quran and Sahih Ahadith about him, we know him to be pious. Some of the ulama took him to be a Nabi. What is Raja? He was probably one of the awliya. But either which way, he was very pious and he ruled the world. Tayyip. Who are the kafiran? The two from the kuffar. Bukh Tanasar. Bukh Tanasar. He is in the time of Daniel alayhi salam. And as we know, any some of the historic narrations about him throwing, throwing Daniel alayhi salam to the lion and so on. This is uh, not going to go in there, but this is one of them. And the other is, and Mujahid says, uh, يعني, The one who debated with Ibrahim regarding his Rabb. The Rawaya from Muawiyah and the Rawaya from uh, Ibn Abbas, they mention the name. They mention the name Namrud. See? Namrud ibn Kana'an. Now, even though the riwayah from Jahid doesn't mention his name, but we know that the one who debated with Ibrahim as mentioned by Qatada with the Hassan riwayah in at Tabari, he said that he was Namrud. And if you look at all of the narrations mentioning the name of the one who debated with Ibrahim his name was Namrud. And it is mentioned for him to be Namrud ibn Kana'an. This was the one that debated with Ibrahim So what do we know? That he was a king, but not just was he a king, he ruled the entire known world. Now imagine Ibrahim 
Who does he have supporting? Which king, which government, which organization, which NGO is backing him? Nobody. Which family, which father, which backing, uncles, guns? Nobody. By himself. Against his own family, against his own society, against a king who rules everywhere so he can't go somewhere else and seek refuge. He can't go somewhere else and be like, yo, I want to apply for asylum, you know, Snowden. No. Anywhere he goes, Namrud can have him sent back to him. Even though there are other small kingdoms, but they all are under the power of Namrud. Tayyip. Here, we look at how this happened. What we find, as Ibn Kathir and the Tabari and others have mentioned, is Azir was the father of Ibrahim as in the Quran. And he has multiple names, as we have mentioned in the Kutub of Tarikh. And he was a priest and a minister of Namrud. So when Ibrahim started to debate, Azir kicked him out. His own father kicked him out. And his society, they, they banished him. And as he went around, the people everywhere that he went, they would criticize him. And he would debate with them. And he won the debate. As Ibn Kathir and others have mentioned that the people at that time had 72 statues, idols. 72 idols. And they used to pray to them. And some of them were shaped like stars or whatever they could, they could imagine the stars in the night to look like. And some of them were in the shape of pious people that they respected. Now this is interesting. Like when you talk about idol worship, you know, it's not like somebody just gets a rock from the, from you know, like you go to Yosemite and you see like a, a big rock and you pick it up and you just worship it. Eh? If you look at idols, they're always shaped after something. Whether it's after a pious Nabi of Allah like Isa ibn Maryam, right? or what they imagined him to be if they were European apparently. Right? So, and, and this is a funny thing, right? You look at Isa ibn Maryam, Rasulullah sallallahu described him as having dark black hair. And it looked wet even when it was dry. And wavy black hair. And this is how Rasulullah described Isa ibn Maryam. Light skin, but again light skin in the, in the context of Arabs. But when you go to a church here, <laughs> you see a guy, blue hair, blue eyes, blonde hair, hanging, you know. I was in Atlanta and they had a different Jesus. He had corn rolls. I'm not kidding. He was black. He had corn rolls and a goatee. I, I kid you not. I have seen an Asian Jesus in a Chinese church. He was Asian looking, right? Why? Because they're not actually, this is not about Isa ibn Maryam. This is about their imaginary God that they have made up. So when you look at idols, it's not about the rock. It's about the imaginary gods people make up. You go, you go and you see, and this is a, a famous poem they have in India, written by a Hindu actually, but then he got banished and stuff. When he said, look at this idol that sits in the mandir. You know mandir? The place of worship. I carved him with my own hands. And today people sit and worship him. It's interesting, right? Like, like is this a rock? They carve it up into an image of something and now suddenly it became so powerful, right? <coughs> So this is a very important point for us to understand, not to fall into the same trick. Some of the people, where you go in the masjid, they'll have big pictures of kings and this and that. And every office you see, mashallah, ulema sitting with big pictures behind them. We, we have to stop this because that's how it starts. Okay? Pictures of shiyukh hanging on walls and things. Yes. There are some things that are necessary like passports or IDs, uh, dawa flyers and things, I understand. But, but when you don't have that necessity to go overboard, I went to a brother's house, he had a big picture of his sheikh hanging, I told him, what is this? He said, this is how I make dhikr, is by looking at this. 
You can't make dhikr without looking. And this is where shirk begins. Or maybe it's already begun. But, right? So, this is what they had. When Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was patient, he debated with them, and he went to different people. And he told them, what do you worship? You worship stars, but look at the stars, they go when the sun comes, when the sun sets. Like he, you know the story, you know that it's in the Quran and Sahih Hadith and things. He gave them da'wah where they believed. Meaning that they understood that he was right, but they didn't bring iman. They just got sick of it, went to the king. So this is, this is, this is it. Like, like think about this in our time as well, right? When you debate and they lose the debate, what do they want to do now? It's called the FBI. Call the government. Get their, get their permit canceled. Why? Because you can't debate them. <laughs> Same thing. So they went to the king. The king said, okay. Well, the people would come in different areas and different times. And some of the ulema said it was during a time when there was a drought and they were getting food. But there is no sanad for this. So either which way, the king got Ibrahim in front of him. Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he told Ibrahim alayhi salam, what do, you, what do you call towards? And, I'm, and again, I'm summarizing because it's not really about Ibrahim as his entire story. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he told them, that I worship Allah, my Rabb. And the king, subhanAllah, he said, what? A Rabb other than me? I'm your Rabb. I'm your Lord. I'm your king. And we see this mentioned in the Quran. Alam tara ila ladina haja Ibrahim. The one, don't you see the one who debated about Ibrahim fi Rabbihi regarding his Rabb? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah atahu Allah mulk. And Allah gave him the mulk. Who gave him the dominion? Who gave him the kingdom? Allah. But look at how he misused it. Instead of being thankful to Allah for Allah had given him, he started to debate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It qala Ibrahim. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam he tells him. That my Rabb, Rabbi Alladi, Yuhi wa Yumit, the one who gives life and death. Now, the Kafir, their mindset is, is only what they can see and touch and feel. Even though they deal with things they can't touch and feel. Right? Sometimes we have atheists come and question us, and they ask us about prove to us that there is a soul. Tell you, I mean, you see a dead body, you see a guy walking around, you see somebody making decisions. They have the same bodily facilities. They, they both have eyes, they both have hearts. What's the difference? This is the, the ruh, the soul that gives them life and so on. They don't understand that, right? So we tell them, okay. They said, they, they say, take out the, the ruh, the soul, and put it in my hand. We get this all the time at the park, you know. Mm. Put it in my hand. We tell them, okay. Is there such a thing called intelligence? Yes. Okay, put intelligence in my hand. Take out intelligence, put it in my hand. Well, no, no, well, we make decisions. Well, I know we make decisions. We also live and walk around. <laughs> but you wanted me to put the ruh in your hand, so now put intelligence in my hand. Well, what about a brain? An idiot's got a brain. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? A person who's dead has a brain. But it's not the same as intelligence. You can't measure intelligence by the size of a brain. Right? There's some people, mashallah, Allah has given them very big heads. <laughs> but I don't know about that intelligence part. <laughs> I mean, if you could, I'd buy intelligence all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's a good commodity and forget Bitcoin, right? <laughs> but you can't. Because this is something that they can't see, but they believe in due to the signs. We say, well, then there is more hujjah upon you to believe what Allah has said. Look at the signs. So, so this king, he said, I'm the one that gives life and death. How? Can anybody make such a claim? So he took a person and killed him. <laughs> he said, look, I gave him death. And he took a prisoner and freed him. He said, look, I gave him life. SubhanAllah. How, how shallow. How any foolish. Look at the miracle of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives life. Allah gives life to insan. Allah gives in life to the earth. You look at a dead piece of land. If you've ever been in San, San Diego's got a lot of areas that are barren. They're dead, they're dry. And then it rains, rains, rains. Nobody goes there and plants seeds. No corporation comes and tells it. You just go there and it's flush green. That's Allah. When you look at a dead person, let, let, let's say the 
most powerful, rich, billion, multi, multi billionaire when they're dead. Pick them up and take every penny in the whole world. Can they, can they bring them back to life? No. This is Allah's. But this man was foolish. He, 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 was, he was bound by his, the weakness of his understanding. So Ibrahim didn't go down that path. And that's a very important point for us in doubt. Some brothers, they get really deep into the whole Muhammad mentioned in the Bible and then they're going and they're going back and forth and you're going back and forth and they're throwing and then you're accepting their rules and going, going, going. No, kill it. Kill the conversation. Ibrahim killed it. He said, okay, my Rabb is the one that brings the shams min al mashriq My Rabb is the one that brings the sun from the east. Tayyib, you bring it from the Maghrib. Go ahead. West. Bring it from the west. My Rabb brings the sun from the east. If you're saying you're the Rabb, bring it from the west. Khalas. Then the one who made kufr was disgraced. He lost the debate. And this is why, like even when in da'wah, when you're looking at the Bible and things, hit the verses that show clear contradictions, hit the verses that clearly show this is not written and accurate, then khalas, that's no longer an authority. End it. When you are following a way, don't worry about this type of uh, inductive logic and this logic and that. Khalas, go to the way of the Anbiya. And will kalam and falsafa and in, in, in philosophy and then oh I'm gonna learn it so I can debate with them and now you're on their on their playing field. Look, our example are the Anbiya, are the Sahaba, are the great Imma and Alima upon the way of the Anbiya, are the Salaf of this Ummah. That is the way we need to follow. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He proved to them the right message that Ibrahim alayhi salam was bringing. So, so what was, what was the solution? Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam won the debates from his father, from his community, from his society, from other people and other areas, won the debates from all of them. Now, the king of the world debates him and loses the debate. Ibrahim alayhi salam won the debate. What is the solution? Kill him. <laughs> you can't. You can't defeat them. Kill them. Kill them. That, that, that's, the, that's the solution. Right? That's what they put forward. So they decided they were going to burn him. One of the things, as Ibn Sa'ad, he mentions, that this was not just the king, by the way. This is very interesting. Like We always think the king just got upset from his own. He's like, kill him. Look, this was at the request of the father, the community of Ibrahim. They're like, we can't debate with this guy. This guy, man, he's a fundamentalist. He's extreme. Get rid of this guy. And this is the thing in our ummah today. I mean, the most harm we get is from the munafiqun on the inside. But it's okay. Allah will deal with them. They build a fire. And I'm not going to go deep into this. You know about this and about how big it was and how strong it was. And, and it's well known. And they catapult him in because they can't get close enough to throw him in. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He showed us a sign an example that every Muslim should take yani, a comfort from. Today we are, inshallah, all of us are du'at. We're callers towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any way that we do da'wah. Maybe you're doing da'wah uh, at your workplace. Maybe you're doing da'wah at the park. Maybe you're doing da'wah by reminding uh, the youth to come to the masjid and teaching them and so on. Whatever way you're doing da'wah, inshallah, we're all involved in this da'wah. Right? And all of us will face challenges. And when you face a challenge, a test will come. Do you break? Like imagine Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's got no support. Like you know, everyone wants to skip to the uh, cool and this. I mean, do, imagine he's tied up. They tied him up with ropes. And he's waiting. And they're building this fire. The fire wasn't built like, hey, let's get some wood. No, it took a long time. And they're telling him, you know, we're going to throw you in that fire, right? Yeah. Even birds that go over are dropping and stuff, like such a fire. Imagine the test of selling out. Imagine the, the, the test of just being like, just kidding. I'm cool. <laughs> I mean, in the Sharia, could you? 
Yes, protection of your life. But this is Ibrahim right? This is the difference. He wasn't looking for an excuse out. He was establishing a hujjah. So they throw him in the, in the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qulna ya naru. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the fire. Kuni bardan musalam. Be cool and peaceful ala Ibrahim. Subhanallah. One of my shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Salam, Rustami, when he made tafsir of this ayah, he said something beautiful. He said, look, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْنَا يَا نَعْمُ or, or fire, be cool on Ibrahim and stopped. That could have been hard. Like, you know, have you ever been in a really cold place? It's really hard. It's not, it's not comfortable. Right? You get hypothermia, you, you know, parts of your body can freeze and fall off, like being really cold isn't good either. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the fire to be cool, but also salam and yani to be at peace so he could be relaxed in it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ala Ibrahim. Okay. Ala Ibrahim me or Ibrahim mu or Ibrahim ma. Fun. Quick. Huh? Me, ma, khilaf al ulama. Ala, al fajar. Mamnu min asar. Ibrahim ma. Tayyib. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say for the fire to be cool upon Ibrahim, alayhi salatu salam. Shaykh Abdul Salam said all of the fires around the whole world would have become cool. This is the amr of Allah. Imagine you're cooking, it would have all become cool. You're trying to warm up at night, it'll all become cold. This is the power of Allah. And this is why the order was so specific. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. There is a riwaya that is mentioned that uh, when he was being thrown, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said, uh, Alaka haja. Uh, but then Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Amma uh, ilayka fala. Yani, if it's from you, then no. right? And from my Rabb. And, but uh, this is not a hadith. When I went and looked up the narrations, this is from Israeliyat. Yes, it is in many of the books that are Islamic history books, but there is no rawaya that I could find from the Prophet وسلم, or from the Sahaba as a Islamic hijjah. Rather, this is from Israeliyat. It's not established uh, authentically, but it is well known that Ibrahim السلام, did not ask anybody for help. I mean, that is known. He didn't beg them, he didn't ask. And the fire became cool on Ibrahim alayhi salam. We always hear that he remained in it for 40 days. We always hear that Ibrahim alayhi salam remained in the fire for 40 days. No evidence for that either. Mm. Except for Israeliyat. I mean, those narrations that are from other religious uh, traditions, we cannot depend on them independently. We can narrate them as historic accounts, we cannot depend on them. Rather what we see is... Uh, Minhal ibn Amr, he says, Anna Ibrahim, and this is Ibn Kathir has in Bidaw al Nihaya, and Al Tabari has authenticated. He says that he stayed Hunaka in the fire, Amma Arba'in, or Amma Khamsin Yawman, yani either 40 or 50 days. He said it could have been either one. Other rawayat mention that there were many days and nights without specifying a number. So we cannot say it was definitely 40 days. But what we do find that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said they were the best days of his life. This is mentioned from some muquf rawayat that we established to be reliable. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, he walks out of the fire. What we find from Mujahid and other tabi'un, the narrations that nothing burnt except the ropes. They tied up with ropes, they threw him in, the fire burnt off the ropes. Why is that important? Now in our ummah we have a new disease and I have to address the diseases I see. I don't care if people don't want me to. Now we have this new disease. There's a gentleman, Abu Qitta, and he has this disease that he's spreading, that there are no miracles. I mean, these were all natural events. He was just thrown in a part of the fire where, you know, like the part of the flame that doesn't burn you. So that's what happened. Musa, and I mean, I heard his audio myself, and he's not important enough for me to give his actual name, but those that need to know, they will know. So this little kitten, 
you know, Zena, you see the little kitten posters? Sometimes they have a little kitten, they put like chains on them and stuff, you know, as if you're going to be scared of a little kitten. You know? Right? You could work out all you want. Nobody's scared of you, buddy. All right? So, he, he has this claim that Musa, alayhi salam, when he crossed the, the, the river, the sea, it wasn't that Allah parted it. It was low tide. <laughs> he got that it was low tide. The moon didn't split. There was a meteorite that hit the moon at the same time. Like, subhanAllah, this is how weak. And then, and then you give yourself titles. Sheikh, Mufti, whatever, right? This is how weak the Iman has become. That you're unable to speak the truth without bending it. Look, I know he watches because he sent messages. I'm just going to send you a message. I would prefer you just come out and become murtad. Then you play these games. Like, just come out. It's okay. We know. You know. Just come out with it. It's all right. No shame in it. Tell you. Ibrahim alayhi salam, amazing miracle. Rope burns, the fire does burn. But it doesn't burn. Ibrahim alayhi salam. He comes out. Days he spends inside the fire, cool, calm, relaxed. As the tabi'un have mentioned in narrations that are and he authenticated, Food was brought to him. He ate. It's not like he was just there and he's like, I'm hungry. No, Allah brought him food. Risk. Imagine you guys are worried about your risk. I'm worried about my risk. Allah brought risk to Ibrahim alayhi salam inside the fire. <laughs> Ibrahim alayhi salam comes out. Amazing miracle. People see him walk out. Burn. Ropes are burnt. He's walking out. What happens? Everybody becomes Muslim, right? No. Who follows him? <laughs> Only Lut and Saad. We find many narrations that mention only one follower because they're talking about the Rijal. But no doubt there were two because Sara, as we know, as Ibn Kathir and the Tabari and others have mentioned, was the cousin of Ibrahim. And she was married to Ibrahim, whether it was before the fire or after the fire, when she was married, Allahu Alam. But she followed Ibrahim السلام, and she was very pious. And Lut السلام, was the only other followers from the people. Of, so this is a very important point because people tell us today, show us a big sign and I'll become Muslim. If it said Allah in the sky, I'll be, well, why doesn't Allah just show me a big sign and then I'll become Muslim? And we get this all the time. If Allah wants me to be Muslim, why don't we get like a, why doesn't something come out of the ground and say Allah is the Lord and then I'll believe. But that's a lie. Because you see that big sign, you'll find some excuse. Just like when we show you so many signs of, of, of Allah, you can find some excuse. These people saw this and they didn't become Muslim. Hidayah is from Allah. You have to want the guidance. You have to want to follow the truth and Allah will guide you. If you don't want to follow the, the truth, Allah does not guide. Zalimun, the oppressors who oppress themselves and others. Tayyib. Here Ibrahim alayhi salam, he came out. Now, there are some weaker narrations. I'm going to mention them for some fawaid, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that they're weak because I know what's going to happen. Somebody's going to click this as they've been doing and they're going to be like, ha, he uses weak hadith, right? I'm letting you know it's weak. Right? Where Namrud became affected. And he told Ibrahim, like he didn't say become Muslim, but he said, I want to make a sacrifice to your Lord. Like, I want to take some animals and sacrifice them to your Lord because your Lord, I mean, <laughs> I see what he does, right? So he was, even though he wasn't affected, the kufr was so strong that he couldn't give it up. But he, he saw this miracle, right? And Ibrahim salam told him, no. Told him, if you want to make a sacrifice for my Lord, you have to believe in him alone first. And even though these are weaker narrations, the benefit here for us is that, which is an established principle in Sharia anyway, which is for your amal to be accepted, you have to have tawheed. People of bid'ah, they do a lot of sacrifice. Sometimes when you tell somebody this person is making shirk, he's worshiping qubur, he's doing this, they're saying, don't talk about him. You know, at that, at that mizar, they have all kinds of food being given out to the drug smokers that are there. I'm not kidding, literally, right? All kinds of charities being given out. He is so charitable. He can do all he wants. If he's on shirk, it's not accepted. 
you guys don't talk about this kafir because you know how many doses he gave to third world countries to infect them, I mean to uh, <laughs> vaccinate them. I'm sorry, I slipped. Right? We said he could do all of that all day long. And his wife. <laughs> but, but if he doesn't have tawheed, there is nothing for him in the act. Why are you again? What's your niyyah? So, Ibrahim alayhi salam seeing that nobody was following him, and what, as Ibn Kathir says, this, that his whole life was at the guidance of Allah, he left. He makes hijrah. And he goes to Sham. And he's in the area of Sham, and he's giving da'wah, and nobody's listening. And here, Lut alayhi salam made hijrah. Tabari and others said that here Lut is then sent to Qawm Lut, where he's not from them, but he's sent to them. And Ibrahim salam continues his da'wah and hijrah. He continues to make hijrah and giving da'wah. And he goes to Misr, to the Umm dunya right? the land of Egypt. And when he goes to Misr, there is a very oppressive king. Now this king, is subservient to Namrud. Like it's not like he's independent, but he rules that area. And this is again mentioned throughout the different kutub of hadith, sanadan with authentic chains, marfu'an from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and from Sahaba. No doubt, I'm just summarizing. So he goes to this area, and this king, what does he do? His thing is that if you're a foreigner traveling through my land, and you're with a wife, He's going to take your wife and violate her. If you're with your mom or your sister, you're okay. And it's kind of a strange thing, right? Like, why does it matter? But reading the works of ulama and one of my own shuyukh, when he explained the seerah, Shaykh Abu Muhammad, may Allah protect him. They explained this. That this king, his thing wasn't just about women. Like, it wasn't like he was just trying to get women. He wanted to be an oppressor, and that's the problem with power. May Allah protect us. Many times, a person thinks, if I became a ruler, I would bring sharia, I would do all these good things, but Allah knows best. May Allah protect us, because most people, majority of the people that get power become dhullah. They become oppressors. Muslim and non. Non, then you're going to almost like, you're going to batting like 100% here, right? But even amongst Muslims, most of the kings, I'm not making takfir on them, take it easy. Right? But most of the kings, when you read their tarikh, they were very hard, hard-handed or harsh. Right? Illa mashaAllah, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills like Umar Abdul Aziz or some great, yani, obviously the Sahaba and so on. But even after Sahaba, we have good examples as well. But majority get corrupted, the, the power goes to their head, they become harsh. Now this man's a kafir. Right? So obviously he's kafir to begin with, and he's oppressive. So his idea is, how can anybody, a foreigner in my land, be enjoying marital relations with anybody? Nope, I'm going to do it. All right. So he gets news. And the news he gets, is there's a man, he's a foreigner, and he's with a woman, and she's very beautiful. Right? Now the ayamma and ayamma say that, that hijab was there in, that, in those ummam as well. And there are some... Uh, any indications to that about when the Malaika came and uh, any, later on we'll talk about that about when they were going to the Bay of Lut and so on so it's not like she was walking around showing her beauty but what happens like, you know, there are women that meet with women and then they go home and describe and that's why when women meet with other women it's haram on them to go home and describe women like, this happens very common nowadays people go to a party or something and they see other women mashallah women who are wearing hijab and niqab and abayat and all this and then they go home and they're like you know who i saw you know what she looks like you know her astaghfirullah like this poor sister is like doing so hard and so much hardship to protect her her beauty and haya and things and now you're going and ruining right it's haram so somebody went and told them this and this the news got to the king the king first called ibrahim because he's a king and he's this one guy, he doesn't know who Ibrahim is, he, he doesn't have an army, he's not, you know, with weaponry. He says, I'm going to get this guy and if he says this is his wife, I'm just going to kill him there and take his wife and nobody can question him. Right? So he calls Ibrahim And now, understand Ibrahim has tawakkul. Ibrahim was just thrown in the fire. I mean, this is past that, right? It's not that he doesn't have tawakkul, but this is a lesson for us and how he dealt with the situation. So, when... He, the king asks Ibrahim, 
Who is this woman with you? And who are you? Like, what's going on? Ibrahim السلام, tells him that my name is Ibrahim and, and this is my sister. Because the rule there was that if it's your sister, then he would not oppress them. And if it was his wife, then they would have killed Ibrahim and taken the wife. Now here, this is not a lie. Many people, I mean, because of the shortness of their, I don't know, ability to think, or lack of intelligence, I'm trying to be polite here, right? Uh, I'm not going to say because of stupidity. So they, they start saying, oh, look, Ibrahim, he lied. No, he didn't lie. Why? There are five types of sisters in the Sharia. If you study Sharia, there are five types. Right? One is your biological sister. Obviously, it's haram to marry your biological sister. Then there is your uh, sister through breastfeeding. Haram to marry your sister through breastfeeding. Then there is your sister through your mother from another husband. Meaning if she has married before or after, then it's also haram. Your father from another wife, that's also haram. But then there is the sister that is just your sister in Iman, in Islam. Right? All Muslims, we say we are brothers and sisters. Ikhwa fil Islam, brotherhood, right? It doesn't mean here that if I say uh, Umar is my brother in Islam, that doesn't mean that if my mother dies or my father dies, he will inherit. Right? This is a different type of brotherhood. It doesn't mean like if uh, Ishaq finds, finds out that there is a sister in Islam, it doesn't mean that because he's, his, his sister in Islam that he can't marry her. Like those, that's a different type of brotherhood. So here Ibrahim is using Toriyah, which is a slope that is used, shouldn't be misused, but it can be used, it's halal, it's jayaz, to say something where the person may understand something different without you lying due to necessity. Like a Shafi'i, for example, as uh, some of the ulama have mentioned, when he was in uh, Iraq still and the mihna was going on, uh, you know, they asked him to say the, the Zabur, the Torah, the Injil, and Quran are makhluq. He would say that these four are makhluq, and he meant his fingers. Right? And Imam Ahmed didn't take it, he went to jail instead. But I mean, this is uh, I mean, both permissible here, right? Like Imam Ahmed, one time he was in a dars, and he had a student, and that student had like foolish friends, like those friends would waste time, like bad friends. So when he was in the dars, those friends came outside, they asked, is he here? So Imam Ahmed pointed to his palm. He goes, he's not here. <laughs> and he, even though the student was in the dars, he didn't want to say yes because he knew that they would waste his time and so on. So this is an example of Ibrahim alayhi salam here, uh, using Toria here, saying that yeah, she's my sister. Now here, because of that, they left him, like he left. But the king, يعني, he, he was a dhalim. And people told him she's really beautiful. You know, she's really special, something amazing. So even though his own rules were that if it's his sister, he would let them go, he broke his own rules. Because those rules aren't based on anything. <laughs> Today we have laws, like you know, in America we have laws. Some of those laws aren't based on anything. Yeah? You can't have this, you can't have this. They're not based, our laws are based on the Sharia. So this is the laws of Allah, we can't play with them. Well, other people's laws, they make them up, they break them. One, one day, you, you sell marijuana and you're a drug dealer, you're, you're a monster, you should be put in jail for years and years and years. And the next day, you're a good tax-paying corporation that should get security and a thank you note from the mayor. Right? All these people that I grew up with that spend years in jail for doing the same thing that you see these little green uh, cross pharmacies doing, what's the difference? Same marijuana. Probably stronger today than it was back in my days, but man-made laws, change them whenever you want. By the way, in Sharia, it's still haram, just don't get any ideas. <laughs> so here, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's freed, but Sarah, she is captured, she is taken. What does Ibrahim do? He doesn't tell Sarah, it's very important, I'm going to go over the time a little bit, don't worry. Right? He doesn't tell her, hey. If he gets close to you, kill yourself. And that's our that's our solution nowadays, like especially in the cultural background that I come from and some of you come from. That the idea is, look, if, if you're ever about to get raped, just kill yourself. Honorable, right? No, that's not what the Sharia allows. As much as me and you and, and our sisters in Islam may prefer that option, but Islam never allows for suicide. Suicide is never an option. Never. Not if you're being tortured and raped and all that, it's still not an option. Be patient for the sake of Allah. Here Ibrahim السلام, tells her that look, when you go and they ask you who you are, 
I said you're my sister. So don't contradict what I said. Go with what I said. Don't be like, no, I'm not going to story. No, this is your husband. That's what he said. Go with it. It's within the halal. Because, and he tells her, because me and you are the only believers on the face of the earth. I mean, other than Lut at the time. But meaning that this is it. If he kills us, who's going to spread the doubt? So she obeys her husband. She's forcefully taken. And, and again, I'm going to emphasize this point. No matter what you're going through, suicide is never an option. One of the Sahabiyat, she was captured by the Kuffar. And they captured her, and she had the camel of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She was going to capture her. She didn't kill herself. She made dua to Allah to free her. And they, they tortured her. It's not like she got away right away. But she didn't kill herself. She made dua, she was patient, and she made another. She said, oh Allah, that if I am freed because of this camel, because she only had the camel, then I will sacrifice it for you. For the sake of Allah. And Allah freed her. I mean, she found a way out. Allah made a way for her. And she rode that camel. She got to Medina. She told the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ told her, you cannot, that this is the uh, bis, I mean, this is the, the worst uh, reply that somebody does. The poor camel got you out. Now you want to kill him. <laughs> the Rasulullah ﷺ taught her the ahkam. He said, you can't make another with other people's property. <laughs> right? So this is, uh, some people are like, I'm ready to give sadaqah. Brother, you got some money? <laughs> Brother, go ahead, give your sadaqah. <laughs> and here, when she's captured and that king has her, he, he intends bad. He intends evil. And he reaches out towards her. What does she do? Does she try to find a knife? Does she start screaming? No. This is iman. She tells him, let me make wudu and let me make a prayer. He doesn't know what salah is, but she does. Before you do anything, just let me. Now this, take, he's taken aback. You know, he's, he's kind of shocked. Like she's not screaming, she's not begging. She's, well, so he allows her. She makes wudu, she makes salah, whatever any way that was at the time. And she seeks Allah's help with salah. She didn't try to lobby. She didn't try to go to any kafir and be like, hey, help us out. You know, it's torture and this. She seeks help with wudu and salah. And she makes dua. And she doesn't say, Oh Allah, because of your Prophet Ibrahim is so loved to you because of him. Like tawassul, people make today. They tell us, bring us adilna. Think, look at the anbiya. Look at the salihin. Instead, she says, Oh Allah. She makes tawassul bil amal al-salihat. Yani from her good deeds. She says, Oh Allah. If I protected my modesty from everybody except my husband, obviously, I mean, with your husband, it's not haram. If I protected my modesty for your sake, don't let this kafir yani, violate me. She used tawassul. Imagine how beloved is Ibrahim salam, to Allah. I mean, he's the Khalil of Allah. He's called the Ummah. Saddam, all this stuff, right? If tawassul making through anbiya, Oh Allah, because of your Prophet was allowed, this would be the perfect situation. She's the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam. She would say, Oh Allah, I'm married to your Prophet Ibrahim. Because of his status, protect me. Don't let him be shamed. But no. She made tawassul with amal. She said, If I protected myself for your sake, don't let this kafir violate. And now, without any sabab, Allah protected her. When the kafir would reach, as some of the narrations mentioned, he would get like a, 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 an attack. He would start making weird noises. Some of them mentioned his arm would get paralyzed, but he was, he was unable to reach. And when that attack would come on him, she became afraid that what if he dies, then people will say, you killed the king. Right? And other narrations, they also mentioned that he asked her that, look, take this condition away from me and I won't harm you. Right? I want to make a deal with you guys. You guys don't fight us, and then you can be fine. And as soon as she made dua, and he was cured, what did he do? What a kafir does. Betrayed his word. Immediately, he leaped again. And she made dua again, and the same thing happened to him again. And he asked her again, and she made dua again. What did he do? 
Learn a lesson? No. Leave that one again. Third time, same thing. Here, now he realized that this is not going to happen. What does he do? He tells the guards, the ones who brought her, you guys didn't bring me a, a good looking woman, you brought me a shaitan, <laughs> a jinn. Now, now what's interesting, maybe you guys didn't notice this, I, 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 I think about these things, right? Last night at about 3.30 a.m. I thought about this. Right? He didn't call her an angel. He called her a shaitan. Who's the shaitan? He's the shaitan. Who's the zani? Who's the doing zina bil jabr? Who's the rapist? Who's the murderer? Who's the tyrant? Who's the valim? Him. What is she doing? Nothing. Making dua, making salah, just wanting to live in peace. What does he call her? Shaitan. Same is true for, for terrorists. Oh, I'm going to say it. Yeah. It's all right. It's not you. It's me. I'm on camera. Not you. Don't worry about it. Eh? What happens? Somebody wants to live as a Muslim. They just want to live in the Sharia. They're, they're, they're given all kinds of titles. Who, who, who drops bombs on blocks and kills babies? Who's the only country in the world that's ever dropped a, a nuclear or atomic bomb on another country? Who, who, who's the one that, that funds genocides? Who's the one that fights people against who terror that's not terrorism same same shaitan same tricks new day he realizes that she has the power of Allah with her and he lets her go but now he's afraid he's kind of like man what if I let her go and she like turns around makes another dua I'm dead right so now Allah has put that rub I don't know how to translate rog, but an awe on him. Right? Fear is khawf. Rog is different. Fear could be like you see a gun, you get scared. Rog, you just, you see Dean walk in the room, you're like, oh, I better straighten up. Right? So, oh yeah, I guess all would be it. So he tells her, look, I'll let you go. And not just that, I'll give you a gift. Just so you don't curse me or something, right? Now here... He gives her a gift, and, and most people today, they say, and what I read and hear, is that he gave her, uh, he had a slave woman named Haja, and he gave the slave woman. But what I found to be correct, after spending a lot of time on this issue, that it was his daughter. What is more correct? That it was not a slave woman that he had, it was actually his daughter. Hajib alayhi salam was the daughter of this king, and he gave her as a gift, as a, now she was a slave to Sara as a gift and Sara السلام, she took this uh, gift back to her husband what is Ibrahim السلام, doing at this time? what is Ibrahim السلام, doing? is he out there trying to lobby the kuffar like hey look at these pictures I made this picture of my wife she's being tortured please help please we'll do a dabka with you that Ibrahim is standing making salah. He's making salah. He's turning to Allah in salah. Imagine a, a man, I mean, uh, those of you that are, imagine your wife has been taken and possibly, I mean, imagine the stress you're under. He's making salah. He sees her in salah, he makes an ishara to her. He makes a sign to her in salah. He doesn't break his salah, but I mean, imagine he wants to know what happened. And here Sarah, he tells, she tells him, that Allah has freed me and protected me from the tyrant and brought Hajar as a gift from, for me. And then she gives Hajar السلام, as a wife to Ibrahim. She didn't say, no, I don't want to have competition here. You know? <laughs> no, she knows she's going to be in the house. She's going to be there. She's, she's going to be with them. She doesn't want to put a test. She says, this is a gift we're given to me. I won't even just give her as a slave to you, rather marry her. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he marries Hajar alayhi salam. And what happens from there? And Ismail alayhi salam, insha'Allah, next week. But Hajar alayhi salam is the mother from whom the generation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam will come. Stop.